And welcome once again to everyone to the second night <clears throat> in the series of meetings, a uh, place to leave for a uh, place of promise. Tonight we are going to be looking at the city of Jericho. <clears throat> Jericho is considered as a city of the moon. Similar to um, Egypt and Ur, they had many gods, many types of worship. And uh, we're not going to be looking into the gods tonight. We did a lot of that last night. But we're going to be looking at some facts that the children of Israel um, left for us as footprints in the sand as we journey along the path to our promised land. They as a people, as an earthly nation, have received their promised land and we are on journey to our promised land. And we are looking for examples or types or, or uh, as the word of God has it, types and antitypes while we look at their sojourn to their city of promise, the land of uh, flowing with milk and honey. So Jericho is considered the city of the moon. Now, as Israel traveled, there are three major symbols that went along with them. And we're going to look a little bit in depth, in depth to some of these symbols. Symbol number one was that the tabernacle or the temple, temple or the place of meeting was with them as they journeyed throughout the land. The Ark of the Covenant, the famous Ark of the Covenant, movies is made off of this. I think you had one of them, um, what's his name, uh, something Jones, Indiana Jones, and he was looking for the Ark of the Covenant. But it's a very important piece of furniture. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant is very symbolic. And the third one is the cross. And you wonder, where is the cross in the traveling of the children of Israel? And we're going to see that this evening. The, this artist's rendition of the tabernacle or the tent of meeting uh, symbolizes uh, at the <clears throat> forefront of this square structure. At the forefront is what they call the altar of a burnt offering, and behind it is the laver where they clean themselves, wash themselves, and at the back is the temple proper, in which you have the holy place and the most holy place. In the most holy place right at the back is where you had the Ark of the Covenant. After the high priest goes in once a year, the presence of the Lord shows up in a cloud or fire above the temple. So all the hosts of Israel, as you see, these tents encamp around the tabernacle, and that was in the center. Now, <clears throat> when the right priest makes the right sacrifice on the right altar, the presence of the Lord is manifest. And that's what we have in the picture before us. This cloud, this represents the presence of the Lord. And today, many people are involved in different activities in church, and we want the presence of the Lord to show up. We want the, the, the Lord to manifest himself around us. But according to the, the type in the Old Testament, there must be the right priest, there must be the right sacrifice, it must be in the right way, in the right kind of altar for God's presence to be among us. The presence of the Lord will be among his people to protect, provide, and promote them when they are in the right. So what are the sacrifices today, according to scripture, that God demands for his people? Uh, the number one is a living sacrifice. So read that in Romans chapter 12 verse 1, where we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And Psalms 51 16 says... God requires a broken heart and a contrite spirit. That is the sacrifice that God demands. A broken heart means not full of pride. You know, some people, they are coming, but they, they don't want to break down their walls. They want to maintain their individualism. 
And God is not about us keeping our own uh, pride. He wants to get that out and recognize he is all in all. So the second sacrifice that God wants is that of a broken spirit. A sacrifice of thanksgiving. Psalms 107 verse 22. In the world today, people are very unthankful. They don't know how to appreciate the things that God has given. And he's the first individual that we ought to thank for all things come from him. The word of God says in him, we both live and move and have our being. And therefore we ought to be thankful for all the provisions that God has given us. And there's a, the fourth one, the sacrifice of giving in Philippians 4 verses 15 to 18. In that passage, Apostle Paul was writing to the Philippian saints and he said that only these individuals communicated to him for his needs. And he says that the gifts that they gave unto him are a sacrifice of thanksgiving of a sweet smelling savor unto the Lord. And we ourselves are encouraged that we should learn to give. You know some people are very stingy in the giving. The Lord wants us to give. The word of God says he loves a cheerful giver. So sacrifice of giving is very important today in the body of Christ. Now <clears throat> the Ark of the Covenant or the ark of God's presence. Wherever this is, it represents that God is amongst the people. Only certain individuals are required to carry this. If they are not sanctified, if they are not individuals called and separated to hold of this uh, artist's rendition of the ark of the covenant, they would be killed. So the Ark of the Covenant, <clears throat> the second symbol that the children of Israel is showing us through their travels, contains three unique items. What are they? <clears throat> One, the pot of manna, which represents Christ as the living bread. The manna that God gave the children of Israel in their journey, they were very hungry and they began to complain. Oh, they bring us out here to kill us off. You know, sometimes you go through a change, you move from one level to the next and you start to complain. They began to complain that God is bringing us out here to kill us off, we and our little ones. And so God brought manna. There were rules with the manna. You were not supposed to take too much. It was just enough, just take enough for you and your family for that night only. God was teaching them that they ought to learn to depend upon his providential care for them. So the pot of manna that was in the Ark of the Covenant represent Christ that would be, were to come in the future as the living bread. In John chapter 6 verses 48 to 51 says, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This bread, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The word of God says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. And we're going to look at that later down. But this bread that they got, this manna, uh, I think that means in Hebrew, what is it? Sometimes God has given us something that we don't even know what he's giving us. But we ought to be thankful. Today, somebody gives you something and they... Have you ever watched somebody get a piece of bread? Or a piece of food and you watch them and they smell it? And they, they investigate it? And they take a little piece? And they think them out to see if it tastes good? Because they never eat it before? I wonder if they did that. They can just imagine the church individual going and they take a little piece of, what is this thing? And they put it to them out, coming out of heaven, falling on the ground. And God wants us to realize that the things that he provides for us, though we may test it and we may try it, it is always the best, it is always good, and it is always sufficient. Christ today is our living bread. He is the one upon whom we feed. He is the one that sustains us, that gives us life forever. The second item that was in the Ark of the Covenant was the tablets of the Ten Commandments, 
which God hewed out of a rock and gave it to Moses as he was on Mount Sinai. Very symbolic. The commandments represent the word of God. It is that word that God said to Joshua after he called him. He says, meditate in my words day and night. Don't let it slip to the left or slip to the right. Don't remove from it. If you keep my words, you will have good success. Joshua chapter 1 verse 1 down um, to about 10 thereabout. Many people today want to have success. But the success sometimes is not good success. The other things they have to do to achieve what they want, God says to keep his word. And the commandments in the Ark of the Covenant is a type of the word that was to come to us. And that word is Jesus. John chapter 1 verses 1 and 14. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is considered the word. He existed before. He was made flesh. He dwelt among us. We know him by many names. But for our purposes this evening, he is considered as the word of God. The third item very important item that was in the Ark of the Covenant is Aaron's rod that budded. There was a how you call it a disagreement in the camp of the children of Israel as they traveled. The disagreement was from a particular group of people had a leader called Corey. This man Corey, he attested or he um, chided with Moses that he himself and Aaron were not supposed to be the only leaders amongst the people. Come on! You're not the only somebody that God can choose to lead. What was ah, we are two in our modern day language. So Moses gave them a test. And Moses said, well, all right then, you choose the men who you think God choose to lead. And all of you come and bring your all staff. And we're going to see what happened. And as they brought all the staffs and laid them down, Aaron's rod, or his staff, budded into an almond tree. An almond branch budded from it. And Corey and all his company were killed. They died, the earth opened, swallowed them up, and killed them. So Aaron's rod represented God's chosen. God's chosen. As Corey and his company refused to accept Aaron, who later became God's high priest, so it has been with Christ. This is type and antitype. Type is what happens before. Antitype is what came later. So Christ is the antitype. We read from Matthew chapter 12, verses 13 to 19. Then saith he to the man, that is Jesus, stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him. How they might destroy him but when Jesus knew it he withdrew himself from thence and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all and charged them that they should not make him known that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying behold my servant whom I have chosen my beloved is in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Jesus is considered my servant. The fulfillment came there when he was walking amongst the people. And the leaders of the day chided with him. Korah was a leader too amongst the people. And you know, you always are going to find that the kind of people who are going to challenge you are those that are within your same frame of reference. It was leaders that challenged Aaron and Moses. And it was the leaders of the day, the Pharisees, that challenged Jesus and said, you are no leader, who you be? What gave you the right to be doing these miracles? But it was fulfilled, he is 
my chosen one. Jesus is the chosen. Jesus is high priest. As Aaron himself became high priest later down, so Jesus is considered or made high priest. We read from Hebrews chapter 5, 1 to 5 and verses 9 to 10. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. You know, many people today are taking all kinds of names upon themselves. One of the most renowned names people are called today is Apostle. Now, I am not going to judge anybody and say that they're not an apostle. I want to make sure I'm not judging any man of God or woman of God for what name they may see themselves to be or what the Lord might reveal to them who they are based upon the work that they do. But I know that once God has chosen a man, as he said in John 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and placed you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit. And when God places you, no man can move you. So it says here, no man taking his honor unto himself, but that he is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As the scripture continues, says, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is our high priest. Later down in the book of Hebrews, we read that we have no more need of a high priest. And in later studies, we're going to be looking at what Israel and the nations of the world and the religious bodies of the world are going to be looking for. They're going to be looking for a new priestly order. And under a new priestly order, there ought to be or there will be a high priest. The word of God says we have no more need of an high priest. For we have one that is in the true tabernacle which is Christ. And the true tabernacle is in heaven. Now the third symbol that the children of Israel has left us as they cross from the house of bondage Egypt towards the land of promise is the cross. And you read from... Numbers chapter 2, from 1 to 34, and chapter 3, 21 to 38. And it tells you how the children of Israel were to encamp around the tabernacle. God is a God of order. He doesn't do anything at all, for sure. God does not waste words. Every single word in the scripture, in the word of God, is not there for style. It's particularly placed there for a particular purpose. And for those who study and read and understand and decipher, you can understand. Even the placing of the children of Israel around the camp was for a particular purpose. And as I was studying this, it amazes me to see the type that the Lord used even as they travel in the desert. They traveled and the ark of the, the, the temple was in the middle of their campings. They encamped around it. God specifically chose four nations. And as they camped, each tribe of the twelve camped with their standards or their, their symbols. Just as we have the coat of arms as one of our standards, they had their flags, their standards. And they, the standards of these four particular tribes were at particular points. And God told them to come that way, and that's how they were. The symbols that was used is the eagle, which is the tribe of Dan, which encamped in the north, the lion, which was represented or the standard of the tribe of Judah, man that, rep that Reuben represented, he encamped in the south of the tabernacle, and Ephraim, whose standard was a cow. Now, I looked at this and I wonder, why is it? Why, what, what, what significance is this? Why does God specifically chose this? And as I read the book of Revelation, 
I understood why God did that. You see, even the very tabernacle and everything and all the, 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 the items and the furniture that was in it represented the true tabernacle that was in heaven. And how they were stated around the tabernacle itself was a picture, was symbolic of what was going on in heaven. And I'll show you that. We read... Um, Revelation chapter 4 verses 6 to 7 and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal and in the midst of the throne and round about it there were four beasts full of eyes before and behind and the first beast was like a lion and the second beast was like a calf and the third beast had the face of a man and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. You know, we really got to really worship God for the level of wisdom and intelligence and simple things that sometimes he gives us to do, simple ordinances that he has commanded us to the very detail. It is extremely important that we follow it to the T. For the things that we follow to the T in obedience to him is only representative of the true nature of God. And such it was in their encampment around the tabernacle. As they rest in the form of the cross, there were unique things that were happening to them. And I particularly highlight this story because it has so much lessons for us. Now while Israel rests in the cross, Balak sought curses against them. This king Balak, he hired a prophet, Balaam, or had a one foot in, one foot out prophet of God. He was hired for curses and he went. And as he was traveling on this mule and this donkey, the angel of the Lord stopped him, rebuked him from going. But for the sake of filthy lucre, for money, he went and sought to curse God's people whom God had blessed. There will be Balaam's and Balak's against us while we rest in the Lord. As the children of Israel and come from place to place, they form the cross. And Balaam, Balak, the king, took Balaam, the prophet, on different places, high places in the hills. And said, come let me show you them, the utter end of them, the utmost end of them. Curse them for me, it's a great group of people. Let me tell you, as you move with the presence of God with you, individuals will find you unstoppable. It may be you alone, but great is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And they will find you unstoppable. Though they may bring all the enchantments against you, yet you will find that they will not be able to stop you. So we find in Numbers 23, 5 to 8 and 19 and 23, we read, And the Lord put a word in Balaam, the prophet's mouth, and said, Return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. And he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, have brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? And how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, what God hath wrought. As we, or rather as Israel, being a type of the people of God today. And as we travel and we go with the cross with us, there are going to be people hired against us. There are going to be people who have all sorts of enchantment against us. But what does Isaiah say? 
No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me. Set the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord that we have this inheritance to claim. That no matter what source the, uh, the curses come from. Whether they come from someone in authority or someone below. Whether they come from some half foot in and half foot out. So called name man of God. Whom God bless, no man curse. And that is the heritage that we as God's people will claim. So as we journey, we should remember the lesson that Israel teaches. What were they? Are we meeting with God? Do we have a place where, and I'm not talking about the church building, do we have a time or place where we gather and we set our face towards God and we seek his presence as the tabernacle was? Do we rest in the finished work of the cross? The encampment of the children of Israel only formed the cross when they rested. The word of God cautions us to rest in the Lord and wait for him. And are we resting in the cross, the finished work of the cross? Or are you still working? There are many individuals who are still working for their salvation. When Jesus was on the cross, he bowed his head and he says, It is finished. The work is done. So we don't have to work for our salvation, for it is accomplished through Jesus Christ. So do we allow Christ to lead us? If we rest in him, does he lead us? And is there a good testimony left behind us as a good guide for those who follow? As much as we have Christ as our example who have gone before us, we must remember that there are those coming behind. And what testimony do we leave? The Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of God's testimony proves that God is all-powerful. And do we have a testimony to show behind us that, hey, we have overcome, that God is all-powerful. I do not have to succumb to the temptations and trials of life. God knows our frame. He remember that we are dust, according to Psalms 103. He knows that we are flesh. But yet we can declare, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened us. Where is our strength coming from? When they arrived near the Jordan River, God prepared them for crossing. So having journeyed to the desert, they are now at the, the edge of the promised land. They are now about to cross over into the land that God has actually promised them. And all the cities they've conquered before, that was at the land of promise. Going to Jericho at the Jordan's river edge is where they now arrive and they're about to cross over. Let me tell you, when you're about to cross over into the place of promise that God has given you, there must be preparation. We're going to look at that. Joshua chapter 3 verses 2 to 5 says, And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host and they commanded the people saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then shall ye remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. Why? For ye have not passed this way before. You have not passed this way before. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders amongst you. As you and I get ready to cross over into new territory, into new places, there must be preparation. And the lesson is that you must not take your eyes off the Lord. It was a big company traveling, over a million people. And just before them were these priests that bore the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony. And so that they don't lose sight of where to go, where to stop their foot, they must leave a space. 
because they have not gone there before. Have you ever, well, let me ask, because I've, I've had this experience in driving. I want to see if there's anybody else who have that experience. Have you ever been driving a particular route ever so often? That it becomes so commonplace that you're not even thinking you need to turn here. You're thinking all kinds of things and you make all the turns. And when you've got to your destination, you wonder, wait, how I got here? You ever happened to anybody? Is, I'm the only person that happened to? I was driving a truck a few years ago, making a delivery for a um, company I worked for. I was coming from the port and I drove up Back Street. I came across, and when I reached Country Pond, I wonder, wait, how I got here? <laughs> I, don't, I made all the right turns. My mind was just not focused, but I was driving. But when you're going in unfamiliar territory, you can't walk as if you don't know where you're going. And you can't lose sight of your guide. And that's why the word of God says, don't come near the ark of testimony. It must be a distance so that you can see it, so that you don't lose sight. Because you have not gone there before. And the individuals who are leading us, the individuals who are leading us as we follow, they lead. God has placed peoples in our lives that we ought to follow. And some of us are followers and some of us are leaders. But at every particular point in a person's life, he is a follower of some sort. So, who are those leading us today? Who are they? Are they called? Are they sanctified? Is God's presence with them as you follow? These people are our fathers. These people are husbands. These people are pastors, they're elders, they're teachers, they're nation leaders, national leaders. And as they lead and we follow, if they don't know where they're going, what will happen to those who follow? They will be lost. They will be lost. The word of God said in 2 Peter 2.19, of whom a man is overcome, is the same is brought into bondage. And there are many individuals, there are many fathers that are leading their children the wrong way. There are many husbands that don't know how to lead their wives properly and their household. There are many pastors that are not leading according to God's leading because God's presence is not with them. There are many elders leading wrong. There are many teachers teaching wrong doctrines and they don't understand what it is they're teaching because God's presence is not with them. They're not sanctified. They don't have the word of God with them. They're not called. And we look to national leaders. National leaders have a power and authority to change laws and bring in all kinds of things in the nation. And the people follow them blindly, not knowing where they're being led. If there's one thing the word of God defends is that we ought to know the people who are leading us. Fathers ought to know their duty and husbands and pastors and elders and teachers and national leaders and we should know who they are. And if they're not leading us aright, we remove ourselves from them. But thank God there is one leader. The thing is, I find that with many leaders, they're very selfish. When God calls people to lead, they are to lead to his delight. They are to lead to acknowledge him, not to build and promote themselves. And we have various selfish leaders in the world today. They lead and according to what they say, you either big them up. And if you don't support them, well, God is not with you because you're not supporting them. It's a selfish issue. God is calling every man and woman to lead people to Christ, to show them Christ. And we are called the light of the world. We are on a candlestick, we are on a, on, on a, on a lamp post, so to speak, and everybody sees us. But when they look at me, who should they see? Christ. And there are many individuals. All they can see is the church leader. And if the church leader not come in church, or if they are overcome by the elder, if he not there, they're not a church. Or if the pastor not there, they're not going nowhere. Or if a certain teacher or a certain leader not there, or a certain boss or manager not there, they're not coming. 
You know why? Because it bonds to him or her. Unless he or she is there, nothing can go good. But God is in control. And so we are, con- we, are, we, are, we are warned not to be overcome by men in the flesh. For they will do what? Bring us into bondage. Of whom a man is overcome, of the same is brought into bondage. John 3, 8, 15 and 16 says, And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When you are come to the brink of the water of the Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. And as they that bear the ark came unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of the harvest, that the waters that were come down from above stood and rose upon a heap very far from the city of Adam that is beside Zaretan and those that came down toward the sea of the plain even the salt sea failed and were cut off and the people passed over right against Jericho is a picture, a satellite image of the Dead Sea today. Jericho is somewhere around here. Eight miles from the Dead Sea, around there, is where Jericho is located. And this is a, a modern day image of the Dead Sea right there. And this is the Jordan River running towards it. Now, the word Jordan means descended. The river Jordan descends from a plateau of highlands into a lower level. It means the descender. Whatever is caught in it is carried into the Dead Sea. Why is it called the Dead Sea? We'll look at that later. Very interesting name, the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea. Why is it called that? The lesson I want us to learn from this is that if we are not led aright, we will end up in where? A dead end. For the river Jordan that the children of Israel is crossing over, parted. What would happen if the priest that was supposed to be called of God, that had the testimony of God going before them as they lead God's people? See, many people, they are leading, but they do not have a good testimony before them. And as the priests and the Levites that has God's testimony that can fail not, and as they step in front of the people, something happens. That which descends and ends up in the Dead Sea parted. And we ought to know the people who are leading us. If they're not leading us right, they will lead us to a dead end. So, the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea, it lies 1,401 feet below sea level. It is the lowest on the planet. There's no other lake or body of water on the planet that is lower than the Dead Sea. It is 1,004 feet deep. It is the deepest body of water on land on the planet. It is 9.6 times saltier than all the oceans on the planet. And there is no life there. Because of the salinity of it, it is impossible for life to be there. And that is why it is also known as the Dead Sea. Those who cannot lead you across the Jordans of life, they will lead you down it. See, as the Jordan parts and the people cross over, That which descends down to that which is dead and lifeless is parted. And as we go through life, we ought to try to find people that can lead us right. Because there's always going to be obstacles. There are always going to be the Jordans, bodies of of water, bodies of obstacle that just stands there before us. And it is the testimony of the Lord. It is the presence of the Lord. It is the power of God that can help us get across to the other side. On the other side of the Jordan was the beginning of 
of the borders of the promised land. And they can look across and see it. There are many individuals who God has blessings for. And you can just see it across there. That job is just barely out of That contract just barely out of your reach. But what? You are not in the proper place. You are not in the right standing with God. Everything seems to be working against you. I want to invite individuals tonight as I interject. While you're seeking to go over to greener pastures, because that is what the promised land was considered. A land filled with milk and honey. There are many people who want to cross too. You and I are not the only one. There are millions of people. There's a movie you're watching years ago, everybody wants heaven, but nobody wants the dead. <laughs> everybody wants heaven. You go to all kinds of different funerals, and the man was a drug addict. The man was a drunkard. And what does the priest say? May his soul rest in peace. There's no peace in the wicked. Lots of people want to cross over, but they don't want to be sanctified. They don't want to be separated. And they want to cross the Jordans of life. There will be Jordans. There will be experiences. There will be difficult times. But God can get us through them all. Read from Joshua chapter 6 as they cross into new territory. They're now crossing over into a land that they have never been before. It's going to be a new day. It's a new experience altogether. And what happens? Joshua chapter 6 verse 1 tells us. Now Josh Jericho was straightly shut up. Because of the children of Israel, none went out and none came in. The place locked down, lock, stuck, and barrel. But the people knew that God promised them that. And let me tell you, the enemy knows the promises that God has for you. And he don't want it to be released. The boss have you raised and you hold on in it tight and you're letting it go. And you're supposed to get a new position, but they're holding it tight and they're not giving it to you. You work for it, you earn it, and they're suddenly going to hold on in it. They're going to let it go easy. Something you have to fight for. It's a stronghold. And there are strongholds that we must overcome in life as we go forward. Just as Jericho was shut up, and they're on the walls and looking down, and they're seeing the people laughing at them. I think it'd be so easy. And this is the city that I want to come and overthrow. And the thing is, the children of Jericho heard all the mighty acts that God did. They knew. That's why they were afraid. That's why the city shut up. Because they knew that the God of these people is a powerful God. But still, they're going to make sure this is not going to be no easy crossover. You're going to have to fight for that. It's a stronghold. The enemy will not let us into his territory easily. There must be persistence. When God called the children of Israel, he said to them, march around the city once every day for six days. On the seventh day, you march around seven times. There must be persistence. There must be sanctification and obedience. And for the first time, this battle, this stronghold, this city, the first city on the land proper called the land flowing with milk and honey, the land of promise. So the first time, it's a new strategy. You know, you want to accomplish certain things in life. And you tried that strategy last, it worked. And you come this year, you try it again. You're not working this time. You're not working this time. Guy wants the girl. He try a couple of words, he get through. She's one of them on his belt. You go another girl and he try that too. That work too. But he meet this particular guy, no matter how hard he try, he can't get through. What are you gonna do? He try a new strategy. Try new, because what he wanted? Break her down. Break her down bit by bit. And the enemy tried to break us down too, you know. Yeah, the enemy know how to get to us as people in the body of Christ. You try one thing that don't work. You try money that don't work. You try to let us lose your job that don't work. You try your wife that work. 
Or you try the wife, that don't work. You try another woman, that work. Or you can't get it with no woman, you can't get it with stealing, you can't get it with lying. What do you get it with? You get it with laziness. And there's so many different strategies that the enemy uses against us. And so it is. When we battle the enemy, we've got to use different strategies as well. The strategy here was marching around the city and shouting until the walls fall down. What is the strategy that God has for your city? Jericho, this is a picture of an artist's rendition of the city of, or the walls of Jericho falling out. That would have been a sight to see and behold. Could you imagine you're there? And you're walking around this particular place and everybody watching you laughing. You know, sometimes the strategy that you're using, people laugh and mock. Wonder what happened as there were people in Jericho and the walls looking on. Wait, we can't go see them again. And they laugh and they mock you to scorn because the thing you're doing is not common. But yet what? God is with you. God is with you. The first city taken upon entering the promised land, Jericho and all they did was march in silence. And the thing is, you know, people will mock you and then call the ark and you're too much open your mouth and say something. You know the kind of way? You just want to give them a, a piece of your mind. God say, you want to take the city? Hush your mouth and say nothing. Don't say nothing at all for seven days until the last day. Shout. For God has given you the victory. God is on our side. God will give us victory. Learn the strategy, listen to his leading, and we will come out victorious. Now, who should be involved in taking strongholds? Who were the people that marched? You know what they were? There were the fathers. There were the mothers. And who else? The little ones. Children are there. Sometimes we, and this is something that I have laid down for my family since my children are babies. I said, wherever I go, they go. And uh, I've encouraged my wife, and things happen in life. Wife is sick, she can't go. You sick, you can't go. So you have to be understanding with other people as well. But as much as possible, wherever I go, especially when it comes to spiritual things, the mother, as a support, should be there. And the children should see mommy and daddy in action breaking down strongholds, working for the Lord. They should be there as much as possible. Not always possible, as I said, God knows everything. But the fathers were there marching, walking around, getting all the insults, being mocked. The mothers were there, being laughed at, mocked, maybe the children, things off the wall. The children, the little ones were there. One thing I noticed is that many of us as parents, we take a lot for granted with our children. We must know how to teach our little ones to fight. It was a fight, you know. It was a fight. It was a fight for the city. It was a fight for ground. It was a fight for new territory. And the children were there too. We must learn how to teach our little ones how to fight. Satan will use Herods and Pharaohs to kill and destroy them whenever he can. Herod will kill out all the children. Was it five years and under? Kill them out. Why? Because they can possibly become leaders to be thrown me. Because Jesus is born. A king of Israel is born. So what? Get rid of them. And what did Pharaoh do? Because the children of Israel could rise up and become a powerful nation. Kill out the children. All the males. I want to speak to us in here tonight as men. It's a very important call God has given us as men. It is the men that Herod attacked the boys it is the men that Pharaoh attacked the boys because in the man image of God is the power and authority of leadership that God wants to lead amongst the nations and all of us here who are men some of us are fathers some of us not yet the question is who is leading us who is leading us as the leaders? As we lead our children, who are we listening to? Children TV programs do a better job than some of us. Yeah, they do. My children come to me and they complain a lot. 
children at school, they call him this and they call him that. They're saying this and they're cursing this and you know, I tell them, it's a curse. It's a curse. And I begin to teach them how to fight. There's some television program and I have been referring to these things for some time now. Because I find that in the body of Christ, much, in, much people are not aware and we're not working towards defeating the enemy sufficiently. But the enemy has his stratagems out there. There are TV programs, and they watch some of them. And they teach children how to use enchantment. They actually set up the mind of children how to warfare. We know about Harry Potter. But that's very open for everybody to see. There are some of them that are very subtle. And what children, our children must begin to learn, and our wives, the women begin to learn, and some of us as men begin to learn, is that the word of God is powerful. The word of God is alive. There are some of these television programs like Pokemon and Digimon and Beyblade and so on. Children watch them. They love them. And what these things show, some of them show imps or little demons that go along with these children. Children. And they ride on the shoulders and they ride on the back and they have them in their back sacks and so on. And when there's a confrontation and when there's a fight, what do the children do? They send these demons to fight for them. The television industry is teaching children that if they are demons, if they are spirits around that you see them, it's okay. You can cohabit with them. Yes, they look ugly, they look gruesome, but hey, it's fine. They can fight for you. The Lord God does not want us to cohabit with no demons. The Lord God don't want us to call no demon a friend. They are our enemy. And TV programs teach the children how to use demons to fight for them. And that's what Harry Potter movie shows. They want to get the victory, they use all kinds of enchantments and all kinds of curses. And they have the magic wand and they use it and they fling it. And so Beyblade, they have cards. And according to them, the, the, the spirit in the card, they fling this card. And this card goes out and it fights. That's what the word of God does. That's what I teach my children. I sit them down one Saturday and say to them, this is how you fight. Just like how they use their cards, your card is the word of God. And you speak against the situation. As we said in Isaiah, no weapon form against you shall prosper. There's no enchantment against you. When they tell you you're stupid, great is he that is in you. And you speak these words. Why? Because you must learn how to fight. You must learn, you must teach them from childhood to come up how to fight. You look in churches, and there, there are people, and even amongst women, they don't know how to pray under the anointing. They don't know how to pray in authority. They don't know how to, in the presence of God, warfare. They don't understand that. You know why? Because they've not been taught. And many times, they're not involved in the battle. Oh, they want to name it and claim it. Many people to tell evangelists who talk about name it and claim it and have all the verses for that but yet they don't know in simple obedience how to take strongholds 2 Corinthians 10 4 to 6 says for we the weapons of our warfare are not carnal they're not fleshy they're not where you can see with the normal eyes but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against where? The knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having in readiness to revenge all disobedience. And having in readiness to revenge all disobedience. And read it again. And having in readiness. You want to take stronghold? You want to take up a city? You want to take up a new territory? You must have in readiness to take revenge when your obedience is fulfilled. Many people want to do a lot for the Lord, but they're walking in disobedience. They want to accomplish great things. They want to overthrow strong towers and strong city. Name it and claim it and get the blessing. But they're living in disobedience. 
living in disobedience. And there are going to be weapons. There are weapons that we have to use. And that's why you said thanksgiving is one of them. Praise is one of them. When the right sacrifice is made on the right altar, which is our body. The word of God said the, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why the sacrifice God wants is that you present your body a living sacrifice. So that when your body, the temple of the Holy Ghost, is making the right sacrifices, God hears and God shows up and things happen. And when you speak out those words and you send out the living word and accomplish things, you don't see what's going on in the heavenlies. But just as those in the television industry, you see what television industry does, they take a truth. They take a truth that is in the spiritual and manifest it to you on the screen. And most of us, when we watch TV, it's just entertainment. But there's a lot of truth coming through the TV. And many of us as Christians can learn from them. If you understand what's going on. You understand that there is warfare going on. That there are spirits associated with people. There are demons assigned to people. But the Holy Spirit is within us. And we have God's word on our lips. The word of God says that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting asunder even to the bone and the marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's nothing more powerful than the two-edged sword, the word of God. It isn't a single-edged sword. When you chop with a single-edged sword, you have to chop up. And chop. When you have a two-edged sword, boom, left, center, anyhow, you cut. Any mark, you make it cuts. The word of God is like that. I would encourage us, those of us who are lackadaisical, in reading and memorizing the word of God, I would encourage us to get more in the Bible. Memorize it. It is the weapon. It is what we use against all strongholds. There are strongholds in our lives. There are health issues that we have. We want to get over it. There are money problems every month. You don't know what's happening. You, 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 you're losing money. You're spending it and you don't know what's going on. The things that's happening negative against you and you, you don't understand why. You, you want your job. There are things that are just going negative. You're supposed to get this thing, but it's just evading you. You're supposed to get this contract and it's just moving. You can't get it because it's a stronghold there. Jesus said, if you want to take the strong man, you must first bind him. The word of God said, the stronger than the stronger, the strong one is here. And that's Jesus Christ. And when we submit ourselves unto Jesus Christ through salvation and have the cross before us, there is nothing that we cannot accomplish. There's no stronghold that we can't break down. Know the stratagem. Know what God wants us to do and do it. First things belong to the Lord. So they're going to Jericho, and the Lord God says, I'm going to give you a new stratagem. You're going to walk, keep quiet for a certain time, and then shout. No sword you're going to use, fling no stone, no bow and arrow, no guns, just shout. Just your mouth. But God cautioned them, when you go in the city, there's some things that belong to me. And he warns them. Joshua chapter 6, 18 to 19. And in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing. Why is it a cursed thing? Because Jericho was a pagan city. They worshiped many gods. Idolatry, adultery, sodomy, and various other things. So, because of idol worship, the altars that they have, they burnt children on them, they burnt animals on them, they sacrificed the demons. Therefore, their wives, their children, their livestock, all their possessions that they have were demonic. And a curse is attached to it. So God says, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves a curse. When you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it, there are many individuals troubling their household because they're doubling in the accursed thing. Years ago, I was coming from Freetown to pick up a brother and a sister. They didn't come to church that day. And at the roundabout, they at Jonah's Corner, 
I met a woman. I gave her a ride. She was coming to the Halberton Hospital. She said, the people in the village where she lives don't like her. So, they have attempted to work witchcraft upon her. She said her daughter woke up one morning early and goes on the gallery and there was some dust in front of the door. And as she stepped over the dust, ignorantly, you know what's going on? She fell ill. From that day, for days, the young lady began to have what the Bible calls an issue of blood. She was bleeding from her vagina every day, non-stop. So the mother realized that it's witchcraft. Somebody did something, the girl couldn't go to school. So I went to the hospital and I saw the girl and prayed with her and so on. I didn't see any results. I don't know what happened thereafter. It was just a one-time meeting. And this woman said that she was complaining to me in the bus. She says, you know, me know what I'm doing. Me know witchcraft, but me not believe in them someday. And you know, there are many Christians ignorantly don't believe that they have obia that can really affect them. You know, we as Christians are sometimes ignorant. Yes, we don't have the power of God, but we must learn how to fight too. We must understand that wickedness is out there. And so the woman was telling me, me I believe in them someday. So me not even go to see. There's another woman, she have her daughter. Daughter took sick. For the same reasons, somebody set she up. They gave her a gift. And she just started, she just said, the meaning just changed. Everything just changed. Unfortunately, that mother went to see. Where she went to see, I don't know if she went to Guadeloupe or somebody in Antigua, but she go to see. And many people in the church today, in churches today, are going to see. They have God in one hand, and yet they're going to see. Because something going on in the house, or somebody gets sick. I want to them, something wrong, so they go to see. Try God! I want to caution anybody here. You don't have no business and go plant nothing under no tree. You don't go and take no money and go and plant it in no corner, no house. You don't take no lime and put it out. If you have a court case, they're going to cut no lime for cut no obey witchcraft. Because if God is with you, who God is, who, if God is for you, no man can be against you. You must understand the power that we have in the name of Jesus. So God says, do not take of the accursed thing. And some of us might have in our homes accursed things. And there are things happening in our houses and we do not understand why it is happening. God wants us to pray intelligently. God wants us to warfare intelligently. And we must ask God to show us, to open our understanding of these things. That we can battle the, and the fights that are there to be fought. So what did God say? silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. As we journey to our promised land and we get victories, what do we give to the Lord? And what do we keep for ourselves? Fortunately, this man Achan, not going to go into the story, he stole something, he stole gold too. The gold is the Lord, don't take none of the gold. Destroy everything, burn everything. Just take the gold, the silver, brass and iron vessels and bring them to me. When God has given us victory over things, when God has answered our prayer, one of the sacrifices we give him is praise and thanksgiving. And if out of our substance we have, we bless the Lord, we bless God's people. For what? Because God is a blessing to us. But the question you have to ask yourself is when God has given you victory, when you have what? You're in the, you're residing in the cross. God's presence is with you. You know you're a man of God. You know you're a woman of God. God has given you victory after victory. What? 
are you giving him? What are you giving him? These represent things that are highly valuable. I don't know if you've ever been going to church and somebody say, when are you going to pray for me? Or they give you a fact and tell you, show that in the offering for me. God don't really want your substance. The first thing God wants is what? Your heart. Your heart. And then many people who are doing a lot of things, thinking that, oh, God is fine. I'm not so bad as. God wants your heart. God wants you to love him with all your soul, your mind, your body, your strength. That's what he wants. He comes to redeem your soul. There's no thing that you can give him. The word of God says, the cattle in a thousand hills are his. Everything is his. You don't need to give God none to appease God. God wants you first. And that's the first thing you can give to God. A brother said to me, before he was saved, he had a son, and his son was ill, and he, you know, he can't get enough money for medical benefits. He used to drink a lot of rum. And when they say, Lord, you know, if, 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 if you save my son and deliver my son, Lord, I serve you. He was unsaved, you know. And the Lord delivered his son. He got the money for medical benefits to send his son abroad and to, to, to help his son. And he said, Tall, this is God. Sometime later, after he got saved, he looked back and he realized, you know, God was with me all along. The word of God says, the goodness of God leadeth men to repentance. And when God is good to you in your unsafe state, you will carnival and all the facts that are going to be coming up soon. White fat and blue jeans fat and geek fat and yellow fat and all the other fats them. And people are planning for them month after month, week after week and they're going these things leading up to carnival. Yet the goodness of God is there. God wants us, in spite of all things, to give him our heart, our life first before we even give him of our substance. Because the substance belongs to him anyway. So, in the middle of difference. There are some things you must remember. What must we remember? As we cross over, as we accomplish things, as we gain victory. John 4. And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan that the Lord spake unto Joshua saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, the river Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and you shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, when your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the world may know the Lord, the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that he might fear the Lord your God forever. When we receive victory, do we share the testimony? Some of us don't get opportunity in churches to stand and speak as I do today. You sit in the pews, that's all you do. But you have a family and you have experiences. You have testimony. Don't wait until you come to church. Tell your children. Let your children know how great God has been in your life. What a great power and testimony God is for you. Let them know. Why? That they might fear your God. The God that you serve forever. Do you have a testimony? Nobody calling you to give no testimony in church. Church don't have that. What about your children? What about your family members? Husbands, what about your wife? Wife, what about your husband? Have you ever shared a victory that God has given you over a situation with your spouse? One of the things I always tell my children in parts and pieces, I can't wait for them to get a little older so I can tell them how I started what I have today, how I started, how the Lord has given me wisdom and understanding to start early. 
But one thing I don't wait is to tell them about the love and power of God. I want to caution all of us tonight. Find somebody that you can tell them about the power and testimony of Jesus Christ in life. Tell your children. You know, there's a saying with generations past that children have to be seen and not heard. And uh, it is said in antiquity that much history is lost because the older folks don't pass on the knowledge of children. And there are people who are now 50 today. Their four parents or their parents were 80 and 90 died with a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, a lot of things happen, and they don't know. I want to encourage us today, don't be like that. The experiences that you have had as you journey with the Lord, let your children know. Talk to them about it. Why? That ye might fear the Lord, that all the people of the earth, that all the people in Antigua, that all the family members will know that there is a God, that he's powerful, that he has worked wonders in your life. Summary. Where are we going? Do you know where you're going? You're on a journey. All of us are on a journey. Where will you end up? Who is leading us there? Are the leaders of good quality? Of good morale? There's a theme that the political, one political party have today. What is it? Um, something about leadership. How we go? Somebody remind me. Come on, you can say. How, how we go? Something about leadership. My nose? Okay, y'all like me. That was a test. You yeah, and I listen to them like how I don't listen to them much. Yeah, you're smart. Um, something about right leadership. Um, how you go? Leadership matters. Leadership matters. Who's leading us? The right kind of people. Is God with us? Is God there? Do we let our children know of the victories we have in our life experiences? I want to encourage us tonight. All of us are going someplace. I don't know where I'll end up two years from now. I have a vision. I have a dream. I write it year by year. Maybe my wife wrote out some plans we have for this year. We've accomplished a few of them in the first quarter. And there's more to go. I don't know if I'll be able to accomplish all. We don't know that. But I want to tell you that as God only reveal his plan for your life in pieces, obey them. And as we obey them, God will reveal to us more and more. And so the blessing comes. And as the victory comes and the blessing comes, remember to give God what is his. And remember let the whole world know that what great things God has done for you. Thank you for coming. Tomorrow night we'll look at the city of Jerusalem. I wish we will see all of you. Bring a friend. May God bless you this evening.